We are built for this network network for the strong, not the weak. Man, H Rap B coming at you live and direct as I do every week. This is a show called Build and Destroy. And as I proceed, what I want to do today is we're having a celebration of our history. And with this celebration of our history, what we're going to do is let folks know I'm going to take assessment from uh, the sisters. It's easy, you know, I am a, uh, I'm of the belief that in our history, we omit the black women. They have been the one constant in our community since the very beginning. And what I want to do is ha have the opinion of a few sisters of what's going on in our community or what has gone in our community and how we can improve it and how they see our community. But before we do that, I'm going to start the show like I start every other show. I want to send homage to my ancestors and my family. Without them, there is no me. So what I do every show is I acknowledge them by saying hello and acknowledge the fact that we, uh, I appreciate them. That is everyone that is uh, connected to the Whitmore, Paula Turner, Battle, Cotton, Harper, Bailey, Chris, Lansdowne, Liggins, Duncan, and Williams family, of course. This is a podcast. This is called Build and Destroy. We are on Built for This Network. I am H. Rap B. And if you are unable to uh, watch live, as I say every week, you can reach us on Spreaker.com, Built for This Network, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Castbox, Deezer, or wherever you download your podcast from. Now, the ladies are coming in. I am slowly going to activate their cameras. And one of the ladies is coming in short. Well, that's everybody. One of the ladies will be coming in. I have one more guest. I have Rhonda. I have Sean. And I have Benita. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. It's going to be a pleasure. Thank you for giving me some of your time. And uh, let's just jump right into this. Let's just jump right into this. Again, as I stated uh, um, a second ago, this is for women. You know, I personally believe, I don't know how you guys feel. Let's, I'm going to start there. How do you get guys feel about how women are represented in black history or Nubian history or people of color history or whatever you want to categorize us as? How do you see it? I'm going to start with Rhonda. I'm going to go to Sean then. Uh, now I'll come to you, Benita. Proceed, Rhonda, please. I don't think that, and this is just my opinion, that we're um, as our story isn't told as much as it could be. Um, and even when our story is told as black women or women of color, you hear the same, you hear the story about the same women, um, Harriet Tubman, um, Mahalia Jackson, um, Madam CJ Walker, you know, Cicely Tyson, because she just recently passed away. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune, but there are other black women that even I'm learning who have made contributions and aren't always recognized. Okay. Sean? So you, Sean. Sean, it's on you. So, so I think we, we get, we've been slighted. You know, we've been shortchanged. And, and, and like she said, there are a lot of women that you uh, have just never heard of. You know, you get the same names even from when I was a, a kid in grammar school. You know, Harriet Tubman, Madam C.J. Walker, Rosa Parks. You know, but it was plenty of women, you know, that, that, that fought for us, not just as women, but as, as, as blacks as a whole. And, and, and it's, it's never mentioned. Okay. I totally agree. I totally agree. Benita? Um, I don't think that we are slighted. I guess it depends on what you're talking about. Like, for instance, if you're talking about, um, if you're talking about in the public school system, mm -hmm. everybody's slighted when it comes to black history. Uh -huh. Men, the women. Uh -huh. But if you're talking about um, us talking about each other or stories that were passed down, 
I think that um, women get just as much due as the men get. And women mm. get just as much due as the brothers mm. get. And I think that um, when you, like, to hear you all say, I didn't think about it this way, but both you all said that there's a, you know, you hear the same names over and over again. Well, truth be told, you hear the same brother names over and over and over again, too. Absolutely. So, I don't think true, that... True. I, I don't think that um, when it comes to the the black experience or the black perspective, I really don't think that the women are left out. Um, the only only people who are leaving us out are the white supremacists. You know, the people who create the school systems, and who create the textbooks. Yes, they do leave us out. Uh, from a man perspective, and obviously you guys pay more attention to this than me, so obviously you have a better perspective than I. The, re the only reason I would disagree with you slightly, Benita, is this. What you said is there is no way to say, hey, you're wrong or I dis I don't disagree with you. What I would like to add to your opinion is this. Every once in a while, they'll creep another brother in there. You know what I mean? We know who Thurgood Marshall is. I, I would challenge and I would agree with the public school system. But if you think about it, Benita, most people only go by what they learn in school. See, when you're dealing with the four people, the three three women right here. You are three of the most astute people that I know. So I think you are using your life experience and your quest of knowledge versus other people's quest for knowledge. I don't think it's as strong. I think people go along with uh, Abraham Lincoln, freed the slaves, George Washington never told a lie. And they go, that's what happened. And, and I think because you are so sharp and you're one of the sharp people, again, all three of you guys are equally sharp. I think because you're so sharp, one of the things that's a burden of intelligent people is we assume, and I don't mean to be saying that arrogantly, you would assume that everybody has your driver. Everybody, like the average person who will be listening to this, don't know who. They think Dre 3000 from Outcast was the first person to say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. You say Fannie Lou Hamer at a cookout, and most people be like, who is that? Who, who is that? The A.T. from Alabama? They're like, no. Nah. You know, so that's why I do believe. The reason I even had this is because I do believe women are slighted. Uh, 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 Shirley Chisholm. Ask somebody who Shirley Chisholm is. Ask somebody who Fannie Lou Hamer is. Like, I, I actually listen to people have a conversation about the Madam C.J. Walker movie or the series on Netflix. And they think Han Annie Malone was some type of insecure, color-struck woman. And she the one who put the lady on. And they stole her from formula. And she was she did all the stuff that Madam CJ did equally. But if you watch that movie, you think that Madam CJ Walker was this robust, domineering woman. And Annie Malone was a clan. And I just don't see it that way. And that's why I would. That's the only thing. I think when, when you are an informed person, when you are on top of your thing, you, you're on top of stuff, you will fall for the myth. Well, I don't even want to call it myth. That's why you would assume, hey, everybody love being me. I love being me. And everybody else love being them. So why would they be slighted? It ain't no more different than the brothers. But I just, I think, you're right, hey, man, because people don't know who uh, 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 Robert Reeve uh, is. People don't, you know, they think he's daddy on the Brady Bunch. This dude helped fun. Bill Street. This dude helped form Black Wall Street. But if you don't know these things, you'll never, you'll never, you'll never find them out. That's why I would just add on to what you said. I think throughout the history of the world, women have been slighted, and that's a man from a man's perspective. It's like Dr. King and uh, Coretta. You never hear about Coretta Scott King. You never hear about Betty Shabazz. And, and most people don't even know they formed a, fr a friendship after those two great men passed. And they, since they've transitioned, they left a hell of a legacy, but don't nobody know that. Uh, I watch a sports show on the regular. My man Shannon Sharp on the show, he said that Betty should, no, no, uh, uh, Bernice King reached out to him personally and said, I'm going to need you to start talking about my mom too. Oh, wow. So that's why I feel that way, Benita. But I mean, again, nobody's wrong or, or nobody, you know, but I just think because you, if you're an intelligent, enlightened person, you go, because I find that, and again, I'm not trying to make myself to be some genius, but when you're an intelligent and enlightened person, and you're having a conversation with somebody, and you're like, huh, what, what do you mean you don't know that? And, and I think that's what this is.
let's start off with this question. What does the whole, and we're going to go uh, the opposite way, Benita, Sean, and then Rhonda. Benita, what does Black History Month mean to you? Life. Mm, that's dope. And not just the month itself, but Black History. Amen. Like, who would have, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't be anybody without it. Like, right. my father, he said to me when I, I was eight years old, he's like, you're Black and don't you ever forget it. And then made sure that I read up on my history so that I can be proud and know who I am. And like, you know, as we're talking about, like all of those women that keep being presented to us, like that, that was um, the whole entire summer that I was turned eight years old. I'm learning all of them. And so then when I made it to like the fifth grade and my teacher said, okay, we're going to learn about black people tomorrow. And I was like, oh yeah, finally, we finally going to get to my classmates are going to see who and what and why I feel the way I feel about being a black person because my family, even though I was born in Chicago, we had moved to South Dakota at that time. And so there weren't any, you know, we were the only black family. So, um, but then it ended up being a paragraph on Martin Luther King and slavery. And I'm like, what? No, we, we have, uh, there's so much more to us than that. And I learned so much more about us than that literally like the summer before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, it, it caused me to be, angry frustrated and to um want to use black history and use our ancestors and go dig them up and learn as much as i could about whoever and then turn around and present those things to my classmates and i just did it so much like and, and it, so it was like one of those we we were both learning at the same time because i was teaching but um so for me it's life like i literally it, it grounded my identity it helped me to be proud of who i am it helped me to love who i am you know i didn't question who i was i wasn't confused i wasn't like well maybe no none of that you know okay. so if it wasn't for me being able to study black history i, I think i would be lost man that's dope that's awesome what about you sean I think, um, you know, black history, like she said, is life. It's a celebration of life, uh, of knowing about excellence, you know, um, especially in the time where I came up where uh, in school, it wasn't much black history, if any at all. You know, that we may have learned at home, what, you know, stories my grandmother or great grandmother would tell us and stuff. You know, we always heard about all of the, you know, white heroes, but you never really, even in TV or movies, and that's, you know, 80s, early 80s, uh, late 70s, you never really saw positive black energy. So when I was introduced to black history, you know, with my family, and then we went to a, a elementary school in a, in a predominantly black neighborhood, and then one day we got a new principal. We had a white principal, and then I guess he retired or got fired or whatever, and then one day we had a black principal. And from that day forward from the whole time that I was in that elementary school till I graduated from eighth grade, we had something in black history that we learned, you know, and it, it made me empowered. It gave me strength. You know, I was going home telling my parents like, Hey, I heard this. And, you know, I was excited and wanted to learn more. So even when I had my own children, I passed the same things down to them. You know, um, I expected them to read, books in black history. I wanted my sons to read the Willie Lynch papers when they were 10. You know, like I wanted to have these conversations with them so they could understand. And not just the, the negative sides of it, but you know, hey, we invented this. We did that. Not just the cotton gin. And, you know, like we did a lot of stuff. And um, my kids, they thank me for that now. Mm -hmm. You know, they my, my, my sons are so pro-black. You know, it's like they want to be, you know, they could be Black Panthers, they probably would, you know, they just, they all about it, you know, and so, I just love it, you know, like I say, it's celebrating Black excellence. Yeah, that's awesome, that's awesome. I haven't heard that term pro-Black in a very long time, it's like, hey man, we're, it's always about the Rainbow Coalition, and I, I and not that I, that I don't want to be an inclusive, but that pro-Black thing kind of touched me right there. Rhonda? Yeah, I mean, I, Oh. I believe in inclusion, you know, but my yeah. bad. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You, you, the floor is <laughs> yours. The floor is yours. Oh, <laughs> you know, I believe in inclusion. You know, you can't. It, it, civilization is what it is. It's all of us. So it's not just 
you know, but in the aspect of black history and black excellence, you know, we, we pro black, you know, we love it. You gotta, you gotta love it. You know, you gotta show that love and don't be afraid to show that love. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda? Um, for me, it's about shedding light on the things that we've accomplished um, and contributed to this country. And it's more than, you know, we've said it, everybody has said it here. It's more than, you know, Martin Luther King and Daniel Hale Williams. There are other people that we are, me specifically, had never heard of or didn't know about their contributions or the things that they did, you know, 60, 70 years ago and how it's impacting us today. And I think we need to... Um, we need to express that more. There needs to be something, you know, our kids, even though I don't have any, but, you know, the young people, they need to know more than just the standard, you know, who people talk about all the time. They need to, you know, pick somebody in particular, no matter the industry, whether it's medical or technical, and learn more about them because it's like no one came up with this idea or thought of this invention today. They're expounding on something that was invented or, you know, tr somebody tried to get a patent for 70, 80 years ago and we're using it. Someone else has elevated it, but they didn't come up with it today. So it's just, you know, show, like I said, showing a light or shedding a light on our contributions as a people to this country. You know what? I, I, uh, I totally agree with all three sisters again. And the only thing I want to do is add to is uh i just want to enlighten you on this ron i'm not sure if you know about this there isn't an african word for aunt or uncle so those are your kids uh the african tradition is that's why your aunts and your uncles you when you like when you see these nba players or these athletes or what have you and they're from the continent they have like eight nine ten names that's because their aunts and their uncles those are their names for them so there is no aunts and uncles in our natural culture so those are your kids. So, you know, and, and that's another thing. That's, that's that's what drives me with this show on Saturdays. Every Saturday to get on. I'm sleepy. I'm tired. I don't feel like doing it. Because every time I learn something, I want to share with my folks. So, yeah, man, that's what, uh, uh, to put it short, in my perspective, black history is world history. It's world history. Because there is not a place on the face of the earth that we don't represent, that they're, they're not doing something that we do. Even so, like something as simple as just being a, 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 a history nerd, and I'm proud of it, up all night on YouTube and, and, and looking at pictures. If you go to those some of those ancient Chinese statues, those people have full lips and they have kinky hair on their statues. Nobody really tells you about that. Right. So, you know, when you look at them, you go, but you have to be dumb enough to be up at 3 o'clock in the morning looking for that stuff, too. But, <laughs> but uh, it's just... Right. right. I'm, no, no, I'm just saying. And the knowledge is there between some regular business hours, too. But I'm just up all night looking. But, but it's just we have to... And what I want to do with Black History is exactly what the, the founder of Negro History Week that morphed into Black History Month, Carter G. Wilson, wanted. He said, and I quote, because he was dissatisfied with the celebration of black history for that week. You know, Marcus Garvey's birth. No, 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 Frederick Douglass' birthday. Happy birthday to ancestor Frederick Douglass as of tomorrow. Uh, he was dissatisfied with the, with the way we represent it. The way we do it now, he, he is, you know, figuratively rolling over in his grave, eyes rolling, ro just pissed because he said, if you can celebrate your history in a month, it ain't worth being celebrated. So, what I want to do with the, the tradition, I'm gonna I pass it on to the brothers last week. I'm gonna pass it on to you sisters. Is let's at at a minimum teach our kids and our kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, neighbors, one thing a week about Black history every week. That way. This is almost like, and what I said last week, and I was ignorant to what his thoughts. Seven days ago, I was ignorant to what I'm telling you today. What I want want to do is, he said we should celebrate it uh, uh, every day, and every, now obviously that's uh, uh, what we should do. But 
I said, I use the metaphor like a birthday. We start celebrating, we celebrate our birthdays on whatever day it is. And the day after, we start talking about what we're going to do next year. So, March 1st, we need to start talking about how we're going to celebrate in 2022 everything that we've learned in 2021. Thoughts on that? Y'all got any thoughts on that? Say that again. I said, do you have any thoughts on that? Just, we should like, like, Black History Month should be like the birthday of Black History. We should be, we should treat it like the the whole month should be the birthday of Black History. And every day, just like we do our birthdays next year, I'm going to throw this big giant party. And then like, like my birthday in August. September, oh yeah, I'm doing this next year. October, I'm doing this next year. November, I'm doing this year. All the way until the month of August, and then we celebrate the whole month of August. For me, we should do the same with our, with our with Black History Month. What are your thoughts on that? Anybody can take the floor. That's kind of like what Sean said. That's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A celebration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a celebration. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and plan it accordingly. Plan, you know, even if you plan something for. Okay, you're planning it for next year or whatever, but you're planning something for each day of the month of, you know. Right. And so they get everybody thinking about it. Get ideas right. moving and bringing up more black history as the days go on. So I think that's an excellent idea. Thank you. Thank and everybody you. may not think about the same person or people to contribute to the party. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's, that's, good. that's exactly what I was hoping for. Because it's easy to just... I mean, it's easy to, to learn something about us every day. I mean, the internet, computers, your remote control on your TV. We did that. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm uh actually, oh, actually, I, I didn't even realize the first question I asked you was one of my questions. Why do you think women in general, because uh, in, in, in North America, are so glossed over, especially the sisters? Uh, Rhonda, Benita, then Sean. I think because and to some people, I'm just gonna say some people, they were still viewed as less than. You know, a woman has her place here in the home. They don't look at the fact that we can be and we are just as strong as a man that's going out there to support and provide and you know stick up for those you know our family and those around us but when you couple being a woman and being a black woman some people view that as oh no that's a devil no no we can't have that and we're looked at a certain way but you can't you know you you can't judge the book by its cover you don't know what our journey is you don't know what our motivation is and it's not always to you know to me about supporting our husband or our mates it's about it could be about a cause it could be about you know what's going on with your child and the school system and now here you are at the forefront you know leading the troops you know to make sure that things are that you know we're treated fairly that our children are treated fairly we have the same you know it's a level playing field so i think we get we've gotten glossed over especially in corporate america because i've been in corporate america for over 20 years we walk in the room and there's a certain um, there's a certain preconceived notion. Okay, I don't know what she's going to say and you know, looking at how we dress and you know what how we speak and don't even get me started on the natural hair thing. So there's always these preconceived notions about us as black women. But like I said, you don't know our journey, our struggle or our motivation. So I think yeah, that's that's why we've been slighted because some people feel that we have a place and being in the front leading charging that's to them is not our place. Benita? Well, you know, I started off saying that I wasn't so I, I didn't feel like um, black women are slighted in history. And I hear what you all are saying, like, well, Benita, maybe you feel that way because you read. Or maybe you feel that way because, um, I, 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 I think black people are slighted. 
Most definitely. You know, I am the, I, I really feel like I am the, the, the poster child or the banner carrier for, um, you know, fight for justice. I'm totally against white supremacy. Absolutely. I'm, I'm usually fighting that, talking about it, those kind of things. Like, when we going to have this skate meeting? Um, like, I don't think that we should be shucking and jiving in the prison. I, I see the whole entire world as one big prison. And so all of us, all of us are slighted. And, um, and, and I realize that, you know, you invited me here to, to describe and to talk about the slight of black women, but I, I really do not think that the collective struggle of black folk is um, maybe more recently, like within maybe the last 30 or 40 years. But if you're looking at history, black men and black women, they did that together. Mm -hmm. Like even even throughout slavery. And, and the only time when they weren't doing it together is when they was forced literally like we will kill you if you don't. But I mean, it was jumping over the broom. Booker T. Washington, when he wrote his book about up from slavery and he said the first thing that they did after they were emancipated was his mom and him his his the the person who was married to his mother sent word hey come be over here he was working and working and working and he sent word hey come stay with us and they literally walked across the mountains you know from virginia to west virginia or west virginia to virginia whatever they walked to him and then he helped to take care of them you know that was a something that they did together so I, I, I don't think that we're slighted. I think that in particular, but when we go back to what Rhonda was saying, that's why I kind of was like, mm, because when Rhonda's talking about having to have the interview here in order to get the job or um, having to work 10 times harder in order to be seen, having to, um, especially in corporate America, like you, you sitting there in a the room with a white man who only has to show up mediocrity. And then you have to be like 50, 100 times better than him just to prove that you do have it. So, yeah, I, I get you there. 100 percent, I get you there. But if we're talking about black history, I feel like those who have authored the books have done a pretty good job. Yeah, 100 percent, as much as they have the brothers. To my sister, Sean. It's all you, Sean. <laughs> um... I, I really had to toss that question back and forth too, because um, I do agree with with both of these ladies here. Um, as women in general, we I think all women have been glossed over. You know, I think there is a certain expectation, like a Victorian principle, that we supposed to live by. And for black women, even coming up through slavery till modern times it was always different than it was for white women. White women could live by all four Victorian principles. Black women, we just had to basically raise the kids and try to, you know, keep the house going. You know, we didn't have the, the, the if, you know, unfortunately, like she said, in the last 60, 70, maybe 70 years, we have been moved away from just being the, 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 the housewife and the mother and, and working to, you know, being in a house with husbands, because you see so many black homes, black women with no husbands there. And we've been kind of slighted over that because when they needed uh, had the help back in the 60s and the 70s when, you know, welfare started coming into the homes and all of that, then the husband couldn't be there. The father couldn't be there. So that's leaving the, the black woman to have to be tough, raise these kids, go to work, try to get through everything. And, 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 so many years of that has gone by that it's almost common nature now. Like it's it's something that's almost expected when a young lady so yeah, I feel like the slighted through history, you know, from from slavery where we was looked at as chattel and, and all they could touch us and do what they wanted with us and take our kids and, and split us up, split our families up all the way through now. And I think we are expected as black women to be strong and just deal with it and just keep right. doing it, you know. So I feel like we have been slighted, you know. I, yeah, black and blacks as a whole have been slighted because that separated us. That separated our men from our women, our families, our children from their father, you know. So as a whole, yes. But I feel like we had to deal with it a lot more because, I mean, unfortunately, you see a lot of dads just all head on. It ain't, you know. They're not expected to do nothing. 
you know, as a woman, I expect my husband or my, you know, I'm not saying that about my boys. I expect them to, if they got kids, you're going to be there and take care of these kids. But right. society as a whole, for how they looking at us and, and how we are, yeah, the black woman is, is, is struggling. You know, they're struggling with that. Yeah, we might be educated and all, but and you know what, uh, Benita, I want to apologize to you because one of the principles of African uh, Africana studies is how do you see you? And I'm at, the question I ask is a white facing media thing. How does white folk? How do white folks see us? So you're right. The struggle is equal. We've all been slighted, but I'm just saying from my perspective as a man. Watching a single mom grow up with two daughters at, at 16 and 17. Uh, a husband that wasn't helping as much. And then she left him alone, met my father. And then watch him die in the bed right next to her. Now I come along and then a couple years later, your your dad died. A couple years after that, your mom died. Now you got to help your sister, your brother. I think women in general should be championed more. And that's really more the question. Why aren't women in general, especially sisters, because, uh, uh, and you can respond if you like, but uh, because it was the sisters that was telling a young, young, uh, robust black boy to calm down, because if he was too robust, that's, you know he was going to get sent down the road. It's women who had to create a trigger mentality, you know, a, a, a self-trigger that if your son excelled at something early, no, no, he, he's a problem. Mm -mm. He's a problem. So, again, he wouldn't get shipped down the road. It was women who had to take take on the the the, 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 uh, the monicum of bed wench and be somebody's wife and still hold your head up and be able to go do a job and take care of your kids. So, that's the perspective I'm looking at it, but I definitely, with your answer, it enlightened me on how a, a white facing, for no for no better term, that question is. So I apologize, and you can respond if you like or, or, or whatever. What I what has come to mind, and what I would like to say is, during the like the Jim Crow era, mm -hmm. eyes on the prize, um. All the wives, all the, all all the, you know, chicken chicken lunches with the knapsack, you know, mm -hmm. like you, you think of all of that, and or I think of like the Black Panthers, like the Elaine Browns, and the mm. I think about like the Angela Davis, I think about um, Nikki Giovanni's, you know what I'm saying? I'm mm -hmm. thinking about uh, that kind of stuff, and that's the reason why it's like it was hard for me, right? Mm -hmm. But then I'm also thinking about how what really helped us was our whole family unit. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we, you, if if this is if this if it's a race and and they ran the race and they're like 200 you know laps ahead of us, the only thing that's going to help us to even come close to catching up is if we start to run a relay race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that I I, I couldn't do it without. Without, I'm, I'm not an island. I'm not here on earth by myself. Like, I absolutely 100% need the, like, for instance, today, I, my man laying in the bed next to me. And, and I, so I didn't have anybody to say, hey, can you put some air on my tire for me? So where'd I go? Next place where I know that they're going to have a man standing there present who's going to put the air in the tire. And I know it's a real simple thing. And it's like, well, Benita, you can get out and put the air in your tire yourself. And I'm like, yeah, but it is nine degrees outside and my fingers are cold, you know, and that kind of thing. And so I guess what I'm saying is throughout the struggle, we had, we, we were there for each other. And, and it came to like this corn, corn commissioner report that came out in the sixties, like or, or, um, real, real early seventies. That was immediately after all of the, like the King riots and that kind of thing. They was like, these, these people are getting this shit together. I'm sorry for cursing. These people are getting this together. And, you know, I thought about that when, Sean, when Sister Sean was talking. These people are getting this together and we have got to figure out a way because they have come too far with a little bit of time. So you think about it, in the 1940s, 1950s, 
we had only been free, air quotes free, because you know what what is you know freedom. So we had only been there for like well you know not that long, not even a hundred years yet. Right. So or barely a hundred years, you know, eighteen sixty five. So in in a hundred years, our people did so much. Like we they had if you look on YouTube, there are videos that will say, hey um make sure that you don't discount the black dollar. You know, black families actually have a lot of money. Uh-huh, uh-huh. They, uh-huh. they have, they got, they have, um, and they said, you know, look at, look at these, you know, maybe you should invest in commercials in the Ebony magazines and the Jet magazines. And our people read those magazines faithfully. Like we support each other so, so tough, so hard because we had no other choice. It was like, it was segregation, right? So, but the families were strong too. So what the current commissioner of report do was get out and these very strategic plans, planning ways and say, Hey, we're going to break up this black family. Okay. And, and, and like you said about the, about the, um, you know, uh, make sure a man is not in the home so that you can get the, so you can get the public aid or whatever. Mm-hmm. But that's just one of the things, like another one of the things is give the black uh-huh. woman the money to get to school, but don't give it to the black man. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Just, I mean, there's, there's like so many of those things where it's like a destructive time to keep us, to break us apart. Um, so that's what comes to mind when I think of, when I think of the, the struggle, when I think of our, our, our black women slighted. I don't think that we, that by design, I guess. But it's funny that you say that because as you were talking about, you know, when welfare entered our world, um, it's like you cre- they created this environment, they created this scenario, and then however many years later, you're condemning the people that have lived off of the scenario that you created. You're condemning the black man for not being in the home. <laughs> Part of you is trying to condemn the black woman because she needed to stand up and do what she needed to do and handle her business for her family, as well as try to go out and find a job because she didn't want her kids or herself to be on public aid for the rest of their lives. So it's like, but you created this, the government, you created this scenario, you created this situation, and I don't, it's like I don't know what their thought process was behind it, but now you're condemning the people who benefited from the situation that you created. That part, I just don't, I don't get that. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I I, I think the thought process behind it, the thought process it is what it really is today. You know, um, we can spend all of our black dollars wherever we choose, but we cannot, um, they will not see us as a unit, as being unified. They're not going to do anything to, you know, we have to do that ourselves, but we have to prove that it's being done to us. You know, and if we don't know that it's being done to us, we it'll never change. Sure. You know, the thought process is exactly what it was to keep these to keep these people who we can't the family the the black community is strongest when the black man is at home and it's a unified unit at home and they working together as a family and raising right. their kids. You know, it's just like basically any other family. At home, my grandma, my aunties, we all lived in the same house. You know, for me, in the even in the eighties, that was different. And my brothers and sisters was the only ones that had two parents at home. Not just grandma and auntie, but my dad was there too, and it made a difference. You know, and so. The further way on this, you go 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 down this road in time. We're not putting it together. It's no. not coming back together. We're not even trying to. We so separated with all of these little small fires. They big things, but they all small fires. We're not seeing the the real problem is that as a unit, it's we there's no black family unit, not like it should be. You know, and that's that's just my opinion. Like it once was, right? And uh, from my perspective, another reason I wanted to exclusively highlight the, the ladies is because it's a lot of young men growing up. And, it, and we, you know, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, or it, we don't have to embrace it. We have to, like you said, address the problem that's in front of us. Sisters are 
angry. I'm, and this is not what, they, what you guys are. But y'all angry. Y'all selfish. You, you, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, you don't want to listen to nobody. And that's the way you guys are presented to the world. You know, you don't see elegant, eloquent, elegant, intelligent sisters who are willing to work together with anybody on television. So it's a lot of young black men that's growing up with the B's and the H's. And, 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 and I'm a bad B and that. And that's another reason I wanted to celebrate the sisters and, and, and not not just uh, uh, put ourselves put us in a situation to where as uh, 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 we're just dealing, we're just get going along to get along. So that's another reason I want to just celebrate the sisters because, in my opinion, as a man, uh, I don't know how you guys uh, survive, but in my world, men are black men are celebrated all the time. You know, you know who Julian Bond is. You know who uh, uh, Andrew Young is. And you know, from my perspective, I don't see a lot of, uh, uh, enough of the sisters. And the reason uh, 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 I want to do this is because I was raised by a single woman, and she didn't get no damn credit. You know, ain't nobody going around talking about the loss and how and that did this. You know, and my grandmother and my my dad's mom, who uh, 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 who raised her eight nine kids and then helped raise her younger sisters and brothers, and brought them up to Chicago one at a time from Tuskegee and. I, that's why I wanted to say, hey, man, we need to celebrate the sisters. And we're going to talk about the history. We're going to celebrate the sisters, too. That's why I had y'all on here. With that being said, we're going to go Benita, Rhonda, then you, Sean. Who's your favorite sister in black history? Come on, Terry. Tubman. And that's because, oh, but first, I want to say thank you for taking time out to celebrate us. I appreciate that. Um. And also, uh, you're right. Our, our social media image is... Uh, we not went in there as well as we should be. Um, and, and I do not think that it's an accurate portrayal of us at all. Um, and so I appreciate you um, setting up this forum because it is a, a more honest portrayal about who we are as people. Um, we love you all. We want to work together and um, we want to have an honest conversation. So to answer your question about who is my favorite um, black woman in history. Mine is Harriet. And yeah, she's one that's been spoken about a lot. But the reason that she's my favorite is because her nickname is Moses. And my mother, when I was a kid growing up, she said that God spoke to her and he said that, or God shared with her that um, all of her children or all these special people in her life represent different characters in the Bible. And mine is Moses. Oh. So, um, and her and her ministry and her struggle, it just always spoke to me. Like the the way she was trying to lead other people along the way. And it seems like that's something that I've been doing since I was eight years old. It's a constant like Come on, y'all. Let's get this. Let's let's have these escape meetings. Let's stop playing around. Let's take this seriously, you know? So that that's me. Who's next? Rhonda? Me. Okay. Um, actually, this is somebody that I learned about this week and I had absolutely no idea, but her name is Mary Kenner and she was an inventor who invented the sanitary mm -hmm. belt. I had absolutely no clue who she was. I had never heard of her until somebody sent me some information. And not only did she um, invent the sanitary belt, but she had her, because of racial discrimination, her patent was prevented for 30 years. Mm -hmm. But in her time, in her life, she had five patents for the toilet paper holder, the back washer that you mount in the bathroom on the wall, and then a carrier attachment for a walker after her sister developed um, MS. I had never, I never knew who, I had never heard of this woman. So I'm like, oh my goodness, because of course, younger, I'm like, okay, what man thought of this? But <laughs> no, it was, I like knowing, you know, that a woman actually came up with this. Um, because when I was younger, my grandmother had the belt, so did my mom. And we just, you know, elevated from that belt to, you know, where it is now. But yeah, I was very impressed by that. Very impressed by that. Well, 
that's what Shane and I did. I never heard of her either. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And you're helping me because to your point about reading, um, I have to read more and learn more and become more educated because I had I had no idea. So thank you. Um, I, I, I could say I don't have like just one particular favorite. Um, I will say like you, uh, Harriet was definitely one of my favorites because of her strength. You wore so many different hats. Um, her love, she came, she didn't have to go back. You know, she was, she was just a phenomenal woman, especially in, in those times. Um, you know, very inspirational. Like he said, let's let's plan these escapes. Let's 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 we gotta get out of here. Don't turn back, don't turn around, just keep going. Um and then another one uh the Maya Angela. You know, um her poetry always even as a child made me feel good, you know, it made me feel inspired, encouraged, you know. Um by the cage bird sings, I could identify with some of, you know, the, the growing pains of being a young black lady, you know what I'm saying? Uh, especially when I got to high school, you know, to a, a high school uh, uh, area in Chicago, it was racist, just extra, you know, they spit on you across the street kind of racist, you know, so, um, yeah, but in general, uh, all us black women, you know, uh, just for the struggles that we come through and uh, our strength and courage, and especially when we can uplift each other, you know. So, uh, I say, uh, you know, happy uh, black history to all women, all black women, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you guys. It's so many that I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't nail it down to one. But uh, what I will do is, uh, I say Fannie Lou Hamer because Fannie Lou Hamer was in Mississippi, and this is when she was dealing with the Dixiecrats. So she infiltrated. She did what we need to start doing with the Republican Party at this point. She infiltrated the Dixiecrats. Her and some of her people moved in. They took over, and it's and it's the party of the black people now. Air quotes. But when you have the intestinal fortitude to say, you know what, y'all down here in Mississippi, mention my brothers and my sisters, and y'all doing all this, but I'm gonna come inside. I'm gonna move people out the way, and I'm gonna get exactly what I'm looking for. You have to respect Fannie Lou Hamer because. Without Fanny, it's a whole lot of things that wouldn't have happened. You know, I, uh, it's an easy pick, but I mean, everybody we said is an awesome person. So for us to have this many awesome people to look up to is a is a privilege in itself. You know, uh, absolutely. And so it, it is very hard. I remember for many years, like Shirley Chisholm was my favorite. I remember. Like, All in Love with Asada and Angela Davis. You know, I've had a lot of favorites over the years, but one that's been consistent is um, Harry. I think that's who's my Okay. How do you guys want to see black women represented? You can take y'all, you know, whoever takes the lead, take the lead at this point. I would I like, like to see this in a more positive. You know, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm just going to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious now about what she was going to say. She's like, she's going to go more positive. Oh, yeah, I just want to see us in a more positive light, not just in the media, but even with each other. You know, I hate the way women, we dog each other sometimes, care. And I think it's it come back to a self-reflection, care for ourselves. You know, I would like us to feel prouder of ourselves and have more, um, just, just, we just got to do better. We do. You know, like for us, if we can treat each other better, you know, if our, uh, our black men can, can treat us better, you know, um, we, we, we just need to be shown in a more positive light. Our love needs to be shown. Our intelligence needs to be shown. We shouldn't just be seen as angry all the time, confrontational or, you know, because we that's not who we are. We're more than you. Benita? Yeah, I would like to see all those stereotypes demystified. That would be real nice. Um, like, we not hoes, we not promiscuous, we not angry, we not and the sad thing is that each and every time that we get labeled angry, it's something that somebody has the right to be angry for. Right. You know, 
Anger is a feeling that everyone, if you're human, you've experienced it. And there's no reason why you should um, not have the right to experience that. So I agree with you there. I also would like to see us, you know, decrease that competition between us sisters. I agree with you there too. Very good point. I, um, matter of fact, I agree with you all on a lot of the things that you've said here. The thing that comes to mind though, for me the most is our relationship with black men. Like, um, I wish that more of that, when we're doing that in a positive light was showcased. Um, we used to maybe say in the eighties or seventies, you know, we had a lot more, even if it wasn't real love, it was faux love, like in videos and stuff like that. And I, I'd like to see more of that come out. And I think it's still there, but social media be lately, like on YouTube or any other social media platform seem to have this uh, war between the brothers and the sisters, like, uh, a, um, like the, the brothers seem to want this pie in the sky type of woman. And, and, and it's, and as if the women only are gold diggers, like we only want men with money, you know, and that just seems what the, the image that seems to be portrayed. And it's sad that that's even portrayed. Yeah. It's portrayed in regular media, but to be portrayed in social media too, we're the ones telling that story and social. That's what social media is all about. It's about you get the final opportunity to tell your story the way you want to tell your story. And this is the story you tell, like you're just repeating the same BS that's um in social media, in regular media, like the news or, or um say the the producers who allow the rap song to get through, like because we know there's all kinds of beautiful rap music out there that doesn't ever come out. You know, it's just that that that's what they promote. So I would love yeah. for that to happen. You know, for us to celebrate each other and work well with each other and this last little point that I would like to make about how I like for us to be seen as the true wonderful mothers that we are. Cause I know a lot of times that we're perceived as these, you know, these women who just want child support, you know, the pay to play type of women. And you, if you don't do this, then you can't see your child. And, and, and yeah, there's some of that going on, but I think that there's a lot of it that where there's mothers who are working really hard to try and make sure that they're, um, their their uh, children get an opportunity to build with their fathers and um before the defenses start getting put up between men and women who are fathers and mothers before they start putting up defenses i would like for um they to, them to work together because the child the child is the one who suffers right. you know in, in the end and so just um being able to put aside petty differences to love on our children i'd like to see that too Rhonda? Um, I agree with everything um, that both of you said. And I think one of the things to me that needs to start is we need to try to figure out where this all started um, with this self-hate and, you know, hating or disliking our brothers and sisters because that's not where we started from. That's not where we came from. Even when it comes to um, raising the children. I remember my grandmother was always there. Uh, my grandmother and my grandfather. And there was, if even if we came from a time when even if your parents weren't home or your mom or your dad weren't home or your grandparents weren't home and you did something wrong, the neighbor across the street or down the street saw you, they knew what you did, and you were still going to be discipline either they were going to you know have a conversation with you you know your parents wouldn't like that you know your grandparents wouldn't like that and then when you got home because they were going to tell it and when you got home you got it when you got home but then at some point that changed and it became you know the neighbor telling the mom okay, or your parents this is what your child did i saw them then you can't tell me about my child and it became a defense so we stopped working and stopped being the village to raise the kids. And it became, you know, this person is out for herself. Don't tell me about my child. And then it's just this animosity that came about. And it's like, seriously, where did this come from? I think to the point about us, you know, loving each other. And I've seen it where we as black women, we will look at each other up and down and we would choose to roll our eyes at each other instead of greeting each other, instead of complimenting each other. And 
it's like, really, where did this come from? How did we get to this point? Even with our, and I just call it black love. When people post things on social media, even though I don't comment on everything, but just to see a beautiful black couple showing their love and showing their truth. Because it's not all peaches and cream. You know, there are going to be ups and downs, but as long as you get through them together, you know, and you show that this is possible, this, you know, you can attain this. But unfortunately, it's the white man's standard of beauty who, you know, that we can blame for a lot of the issues when it comes to relationships. You know, brothers, some brothers who only want, you know, a light skinned, long hair woman or a white woman. And it's like, okay. Or, you know, being disrespectful towards a woman. Why? You came, like Tupac said, you came from a woman. So how are you disrespecting this woman? So I think the values that we had when we were younger, when we had Big Mama and Granny either in the house or, you know, by telephone, all of that, we need to get back to that. We need to get back to that place. Um, You know, there needs to be healing to me with us as women then with the brothers, and then we can come together and heal and move forward. I think it's possible. It's just, you know, putting in the effort, putting in the work, and knowing that this isn't something that we can fix, resolve, or heal overnight. Oh, well, those are, all those are excellent answers. Um, and I really like, I can't add anything to it because it's, a, it's an awesome situation. Uh, 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 it is, it's, it is. It's a situation to where as one, one, one again. I'm a firm believer. Some people don't agree, Michelle. Uh, I think women are truly the pace setters, and you can see it in African uh, 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 lore when the queen mothers actually pick a king. So I think until we get back to our foundation, we're gonna continue to struggle because we have to create these images and as far as those people in the neighborhood that start doing that i always say those are the people who thought their parents were picking on them you know uh, don't tell me about my kids because you thought your mother was picking on you when she punished you for whatever you did you didn't realize that your mother was doing what she had to do to ensure that you were going to see tomorrow and you know a lot of people say hey, you shouldn't spank your kids and things of that nature. You know what? I'm a person who was a bit almost outgrew with an iron fist. And now at 50, with my kid, my youngest child being only had two kids, my youngest being 23, oldest being 27, that I should have found a happy medium. So it's just a situation to where as until again, until we get right with the sisters. And I understand exactly where Benita's coming from, but I'm telling you, it's nothing like being dog ass tired, and somebody just to be like, "Yeah, hey, how you doing?" So, uh, you know, again, Benita, I totally get it now after you reframed it, or I, I actually listened. But I think the sister needs to be elevated because, and and I think that needs to come from within the community. Again, I'm not talking about white facing media, and that's what framed that question. Until the brothers start elevating the women instead of the B's and the H's, as my man, uh, brother Mike Neal says at Black Love on every Saturday. Come in, hang out with us today, Black Love people, uh, in a, it's in a couple hours, actually. But uh, until we start elevating the sisters, we're going to continue to do this thing over and over and over again. Uh, I sent y'all a question after I proofread it. Uh, uh, I'm glad y'all didn't say, hey, dummy, what is this last, this next question? But, um, uh, it's about the feminist movement. What role does the feminist movement play in our community? I'm uh, Sean, Benita, Rhonda. If any. Uh, the feminist movement. Um, I mean, I guess in my mind, maybe it kind of detracted away from the black community. Mm. You know, it kind of divided the fight. You know, um, that that's that's basically you know I think it kind of divided our fight. Whereas we need to be fighting to reunite. You know, as a community, as a whole, black community, uh, family units. We, you know, black family units. We need to be fighting for those things. And I think that 
uh, it came in at an opportune time to, to, to take us from, you know, uh, from what we needed as a community. Okay. Bonita? I absolutely, totally agree. I don't think that there, there is, I'm trying to remember the question exactly the way you put it, but where, where is the role of the feminist movement in the um, black community? And I think they're a destructive, like what is the role of them? I think it's a destructive, mm. a destructive force. That's what I think it is. Like mm. it has literally a broken, a broken home. Like just imagine this. Um, both parties are working their ass off mm. to bring home whatever they could. Both parties are have an equal footing as far as finances or, you know, I, at least, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I don't see where the black man was winning that much over the black woman. Right. So for the black woman to turn around and say to her right. counterpart, the black man, I want to make as much as you make and I want to be equal and I want equality. She already had it. So what was the fight about? And it, so the fight wasn't against the black woman and the black man, but it definitely helped to um, break that down, destroy it, hurt it. The fight was. And I really don't even think that the feminist movement, that the, the fight is the white woman against the white man. I think that it seriously was the whole entire thing. You know, I'm one of these conspiracy theorists, so I don't know, maybe it's BS, but um, in my head, you can't tell me that it's not. Um, I really think the whole thing was created just to break down the black family. Because when I sit at a table at work with white they don't ever complain. They not ever, they, they bragging. They sit at the table bragging about their husbands. They like, oh yeah, my husband this, my husband this, my husband that. Never does she say my husband makes more money and I'm pissed about it. <laughs> if he makes more money, she happy and she going home to that really clutch life that he's um, put together for them and their family. She's not one bit of mad that she's only making 70 cents for his dollars. Now, they may be out there doing some rallies or something like that, or they might be complaining about it, you know, um, I don't know, somewhere, but the reality is, I think it was just something that was literally created, like if the, the Margaret Singers, you know, those kind of people, that that's where that movement came, you know, the kind of, the kind of, the kind of females who were like sewing the clam ropes, those who came up with the feminist movement. So I'm, I'm not for it. I'm against it. And I don't trust it. And, and I think that it has absolutely no place, none whatsoever. I mean, if you guys want to do that, if the white woman wants with them and their, their men, go ahead, take it. You can have it. But no, nah, don't ask me to join it. Before you go around, I want to thank everybody in the chat room, both chat rooms on Spreaker.com as well as on YouTube. Thank you. Please, if you can, hit the link, hit the like button, hit the share button on both platforms, especially on YouTube. Hit the like button and the share button. It helps us grow. And again, uh, this is Built for This Network. I am H. Rob D. This is uh, Build and Destroy on the show called uh, uh, The End of the Bench. Proceed, please, Ron. You know, I never thought about it until the um, divisiveness. I never thought about it until listening to you ladies right now because... Now, and now that you're talking about it, it's like we were already fighting for a level or an equal playing field. But then when you bring in this feminine movement, you're intentionally, the government is intentionally trying to divide us, you know, as a black family, if, even more than what we, you know, already are. Because your spouse, your mate, whatever, she's at home trying to, you know, take care of kids and take care of household while you're out fighting the struggle. And then all of a sudden here is someone that comes in and saying, oh, but you need to be out there too because you're not equal to him. You all aren't on the same page. So they're creating these um, unnecessary issues or added issues into your household. I never thought of, I never thought of that. Thank you, ladies. No, we didn't need any other um, challenges or issues at home. Well, see, in addition to, in addition to that, we worked. So black women were, black women were, like, both of them, they was getting up, they was leaving, they was going, they was both going to work. Right, Like, right. the story of Rosa Parks, she's a seamstress, right? She wasn't, like, at home chilling, okay, honey, I'll see right. you later. No, she had to, 
You know, she was doing everything. And, and then in addition to that, she had more education than he did. So that, that, that story of, of us, like them winning over us, like we was both working our asses off. Like the guy, they, they would be the seamstress. And even if she was at home taking care of kids while he went out to work, and she was iron, ironing, and cleaning, washing, exactly. But the, no, hold on, sister. Ironing was not only for mm-hmm. their family. She was ironing to then turn around and, and, and sell that. You know what I'm saying? She was doing, she had like little at home businesses, like little right. side hustles. There was, the 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 um the black woman was bringing something in and the black man right. was bringing something in. That right. was a, a unified contribution since slavery. And like um and then or the other the and other, that kind of go back. Well, go ahead. Oh, real quick, I was gonna say like you know how they try to divide us between like the house and the field, right? And then mm-hmm. you know in the house. They were like rolling that glass out real fine, teeny, teeny, tiny to put in the food so mass could die slowly. You know, there was like a, a we, we were working together soldiers. And I just would love to see us get back to that. Go ahead, sis. I'm sorry. Great point. Thank you. No, I was, I was just, that just made me think about, you know, what you were saying as, as far as the roles um, of black women versus the white women. And, and it was just... I'll go back to an earlier question that, that we were talking about, and our expectations were different. So our life was a harder, you know, especially uh, not so maybe so much as to compare to the black man, but definitely compared to the white woman. We was expected to go out and work and take care of the kids and take care of the house, and where the white woman could just take care of the kids and cook, or she might have a maid, and I, we was probably the damn maid. You know, excuse my language. You know, so. It, I don't know. That just that just crossed my mind as you was talking. I'm sorry for cutting you off. Uh, just to uh, uh, just to piggyback on that, hey Sean, you had to take care of their damn kids too. That wasn't no damn maid. Right. You was the maid and the babysitter and the and the midwife and everything else for there. That, and that you know, exactly. you know, just to add on to that. And then the re- the reason for this question is really I lost a good friend. Because she used to always say she was a feminist. She was a feminist. She was a feminist. And I was like, you black. And she used to, and I'm not, I'm still a feminist. And I was like, yeah. Where what was what was the feminist movement when Trayvon Martin mama was out there crying? And Mike Brown mama was out there crying. And we can go on and on. I say, where were they at? I say, like, do you remember the day that 51, what was that, 54% of them? Uh, voted for Donald Trump and then had a meeting the next day and Tamika Mallory and those sisters who organized the sisters they didn't even know about this million woman march the next day I said what was the feminist movement then so that's why I even had this question it's like man knock it off you know we ain't got no time to be fighting y'all fight and I'll fight we gonna fight our fight once I get like like your grandma you say clean up your own damn house and then we go help somebody else right. so it really you know I, I, and I'm not gonna lie to you I was glad to let her go you know She's a cool girl. I've been knowing her for years. But when she, I went, you know, we can't even be friends no more. You know, I was two fingers, one word. Don't let the dough hit you on the way out, you know. But, you know, you know, it's just, uh, uh, I just, that feminist thing, it just sticks a dagger in my heart. With that being said, uh, how hard is it being a black woman, Rhonda, Benita, uh, Senator? Well, I think we've touched on this um, in one of your other questions, because when we walk into a room, it's, you know, okay, here comes an angry black woman. But to Benita's point, what are we angry about? You don't know what happened this morning or five minutes ago before I walked in the room, the reason why I have this look on my face. I love being a black woman. I'm a beautiful, intelligent black woman. Thanks to Benita, I need to do some more reading. Um, but you know, depending on the room you walk in, it's challenging. It's challenging because like I said, going, you know, with corporate America, I think that's one of the, um, places where I've seen it the most that's a little disheartening because I don't care what, you know, Becky Sue has on, Rhonda can't walk in there like that. You know, Rhonda can't walk in to work with the wrinkled pants and the wrinkled shirt and hair looking, you know, crazy. Rhonda has to be to the nines. But it took one of my 
mentors, who was a sister, well-polished, loved her, still love her to this day, she made a point of saying to me, you know, they don't like when you, when we come in wearing makeup every day. Why? I didn't understand that. I mean, I was like 20 some years old, but I'm sorry, watching my grandmother go to Children's Memorial Hospital, she put on makeup every day. My mother put on makeup every day to go to work. So that's something that I knew about. That's something that I can, I was conditioned. So, okay, this is what I'm going to do. But it's just, it's like, you know, like they said, we have to, it's like we have to work 10 times harder, you know, just to compete with their laziness because they're just skating by. But we have to work 10 times, 50 times harder to get, you know, the recognition. And it's just, you know, especially in corporate America, it's just, it's a little aggravating. It's a little frustrating. Um, since now, since George Floyd's murder, it's, you know, well, we want to have these diversity and inclusion um, sessions, and we want to know how you feel. And no, you don't. You don't want to know how I feel because just like me, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and own how you behaved, own the things that you said, own the things that you've done. So it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult. Benita? Oh, Lord. Sis. <laughs> Thank you. Difficult is like an understatement. Just, um, and I'm not saying that to disagree with what you're saying. I completely right. agree with everything you're saying, sis. I, um, and I guess it depends on the room. That's like true. this room right here, man, yeah, being black is beautiful, right? That's being black is right. easy. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, um, and I, I absolutely love being a black woman. Like if I woke up and um, looked in the mirror and I was somebody different, I, would, I wouldn't like that. I would scream, I would holler, and I'd be searching the world trying to find where's Benita. Right. Um, I, I know um, when, when, the, when the conversation is about racism or diversity, Oh, that's very easy for me. I can have those conversations um, with other black people. When I have to have it with other white people, it just feels like I'm light years ahead of them. Like I'm like tiring sometimes, maybe sometimes a little exhausting. Sometimes I feel like, <sighs> okay, here we go again. Right. And then sometimes I feel like um, you just don't get it. You just don't get it. And it's so refreshing when you run into some white people who do get it and they or they at least want to or they have like and they and they sincerely really want to and they like, oh, okay, well, let's let's hear what you really have to say. Every now and then you run in like that, but for the most part, it's um a facade of some kind. Seneca? Um Yeah. Yeah, and it gets it gets hard when uh, it just depends on the room. I'm sorry. It just depends on the room. It just depends on the room. It, it's, it's, there's some rooms where it's way more difficult than others, and, and and it all boils down to white supremacy. You know, not being able to do. Go ahead, sis. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. It's a uh, white supremacy, male chauvinism. Like it's it's a whole lot that go with us being black women, and it's rough. You know, I worked in the corporate world. I didn't went and re-educated and re-educated and re-educated, you know, to try to the proverbial coming up. I'm trying to come up and get better and do better. And it just seemed like no matter, in the, especially in the corporate set, no matter how hard, hard I tried, I always had to just do like a thousand percent more. You know, I had to just be the best if I was to get that little bit of raise or, you know, and then once I got it, now I'm being looked at a certain way and now I got to, you know, I got to damn near do the president's job to keep my job going just to get a little bit more recognition, you know, I'm, I, you know, so it's, it's been rough, you know, I, I, I got, I've been to school so many times for so many different things and then I can think about times where I walked in someplace with the experience, with the education, with the credentials to say I can do this job. And because it was a male, white, dominant uh, position, 
not only did I get passed around three times in the interviews, like, oh, we're going to send you over here to the general manager, or we'll send you to this person. Nobody wanted to hire for that job. It did not matter. You know, and people, and, and the, the, the crazy thing is that a buddy of mine who was uh, part Arab and part Puerto Rican, you know, so he looks more fair-skinned, we went for the same positions. He had less credentials, and they still gave him that job. You know, wow. so that's the type of thing as a black woman that I've been dealing with all my life. You know, I'm I'm say, I'm happy to say now I just work from home and I don't even have to deal with none of that. You know, like I just do me. You right. know, but yeah, it's been rough. And 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 again, that's why I wanted to do this because again, man, you know, just from a man perspective, I just think women, sisters, sisters. And uh, no disrespect to the white sisters, but that ain't my fight. But uh, it's just I think sisters are overlooked. Sisters, you know, Malcolm X said 50 years ago, 55 years ago, uh, black women are the most disrespected uh, species on the face of the earth. And to Benita's point, I think that's that's no longer the case. We got to stop doing this, and we got to start doing this. And then if we turn to again, that's white facing media. That we listening to what somebody else say about us, and then we're going with it. Uh, people who listen to my show in the past, y'all have heard me rail and rail and rail about black on black crime. I don't believe that's a real thing. Uh, I'm a former criminal. Oh, I'm not a former criminal justice major. My degree is in criminal justice. So when I look at we at 91 percent and everybody else is no longer lower than 89, that makes me normal. And when you got redlining and things of that nature, that means we're super normal. You forced me, think about it like this. You forced me to live in this box. So, of course, me and the people in that box are going to fight. But if you have free reign around the world and you still are just as bad as me, you're actually worse. So, again, I need, that's why I want to protect the sisters, let sisters be seen, intelligent, beautiful sisters be seen in front of the whole world. Because we, we have built for this network on Spreaker.com. We got an international following. So, People are going to hear this all over the world. People are going to see this all over the world. And they're going to be able to respect the fact that that every black woman, ain't, y'all referring these to each other as sis, not the other word that you that they sing. B and uh, no, nah, we're not doing that no more. You know what I'm saying? And just like that other magic word, I'm slowly but surely working that out of my uh, uh, vocabulary as well. And uh, shout out to Ed Lovell for saying that. He said, you know how hard it is to punch somebody in the face if you call them brother? He said, you'll be upset with him, but you're not quick to punch him in his face. And you're definitely not going to shoot him. So, shout out to Ed Lover for that. Uh, the second to the last question, we're going to go Seneca, we're going to go Benita, we're going to go Rhonda, is how can we change that, if at all? Um, the culture has to change. You know, the, the culture where we embracing uh, the negative uh, music, the negative stereotypes, the, you know, calling each other the B word. That All of that culture has to change. We got to embrace it with love. Only, only, you know, hard work and love. That's that's the bottom line. If we're not loving each other, it's not going to ever change. If we're not trying to uh, educate each other, you know, and open our minds and, 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 and educate and love our children, it's not going to change. You know, I wish it would change, but that's what it's going to take. It's going to take all of us to be willing to even embrace it. You know, some people like the status quo, you know, and so for those, though, it, it take um, people to, to, to try to break down those degrees to the status quo for culture. Okay. Benita? Uh, Certainly, I'm going to add to that and definitely not take away. I'm in agreement with uh, what Sis said. I would like to also add that we um, celebrate each other. I don't want to take anything away from this. Like, I don't want to say, oh, we need to work together, we need to work together, we need to work together so much that I'm saying, no, don't celebrate us. No, 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 no. I absolutely am in support of you, you and the other brother celebrating us. I think that what we need to do is just continue to celebrate each other. You know, like, like the part of me and what I am saying and what I'm bringing to the table is I honor your, I honor your celebration of me and my sisters and all the other sisters on earth by, by celebrating you and all the other brothers as well. 
And I think that that's one of the ways to get there is that we celebrate each other. That if we are in company with sisters and they um talking bad about brothers, that we, you know, we kind of check it and we say no. Or if we hear the gossipy things from one sister to the other or the competitiveness, you know, we we celebrate each other. And in addition to celebrating each other, that we um that we we provide a sense of humility with it. So then we are when we are celebrated, we don't be like, yeah, that's right, that's how it's supposed to be. I am that, you know. Like when you say, hey, I want to celebrate you, I say, mm-hmm, thank you, and I celebrate you too, and bring and bring a a sense of humility to it. Like we're all here on earth, we all need each other. None of us are an island. It really, really bothers me when I hear phrases like, I don't need a man. That oh, that bothers me so much. Because when, when, if I studied your life and I, and I observed you for every minute of the day, eventually I'm going to see a point in time when you needed a man, right? And, and so I don't want to ever hear any of my fellow sisters say that. And I, and I don't want to hear brothers say that about us as women. You know, that's, I think that's a very degrading thing to us as a people. You don't hear other, um, not that we're in competition with other races, but races that are are, are getting along and, and making good progress and, you know, building and, like you said, build for this network. You know, when people are building and networking, they're not making statements like, I don't need you, you know? Amen. So celebrating each other in a humble way and recognizing that we are not an island and we need each other. Um, Ron, um, amen. I, you know, I wish I had my sound effects up. I, I'd have gave you, I do got them up. I'm going to give you a round of applause on that So, uh, go ahead, Rhonda. Um, I agree with both of uh, the sisters and what they're saying. And I just, when I wrote down the question, the first thing that I wrote down as my answer was each one teach one. We have to teach each other. We have to, as black women, we have to teach each other how to treat each other. Because if we don't, and I've said this on um, the show before, if we don't respect each other as black women, how can we expect somebody else to respect us? Each one teach one when it comes to the brothers. We have to teach them how to respect us. And it's, you know, when we can respect each other, we can grow together and build together. We just have to, we can't hold on to all the knowledge and we're just going to keep it for ourselves. I'm not going to share this information. I'm not trying to help anybody else. I'm all about self. That's not how we're going to get anywhere. That's not how we're going to grow. We each, we all have to teach each other and build it and grow together. With that being said, this will be our last question of the evening. And I totally agree with all you ladies. Uh, and salute to all of you. Uh, as a black woman, how do you see our future? We're going to go Rhonda. We're going to go Benita. You know what? We're going to go Rhonda, Seneca. Benita, you close out because the reason I want you to close out is because I want you to promote your show tomorrow. Rhonda, Seneca, um, then Benita. I see our future. Our future can be bright if we, again, continue to teach each, each one, teach one. But then I also think we have to come together during the good times and the bad times. Since George Floyd's murder, we were out there in droves supporting across this country. But when it comes to, you know, just everyday life or, you know, just a positive, something positive, we can't do that. It's always a group of us. There were thousands of us out marching and protesting and, you know, speaking up against this man who lost his life. But then when the dust settles, you know, there's several people here in Chicago. People post different things where you have several people of color that are missing. They've been missing for days. Okay, where's the protesting and the marching then? You know, since we've been working from home, um, the numbers for domestic violence have gone up. Where is the protesting and the marching for these women or these men, depending on what's going on in our households? So I think our future um, is bright. I'm optimistic, but we have to be consistent. We can't just march and protest when, you know, life happens from a negative standpoint. We have to march and protest and speak up for the positive things as well. Seneca? 
I'm uh, I'm pretty optimistic optimistic about our future. You know, um, like she said, we have to celebrate each other. We have to be able to break down some of our barriers and our walls with each other. Um, you know, take the time to get educate each other, educate ourselves. You know, show love in our community. Uh, black women show love to each other. Black men show love to each other. Love our families. You know. Um, and, and, and just, you know, keep striving to be better and do better, you know, and, and, and we have to, um, you know, try to maybe make more opportunities for ourselves and for each other, you know, um, more, uh, I don't mean like saying that's from the world, but, you know, more support, you know, more support with our businesses, our black owned businesses, or you know just whatever we trying to do we have to we have to embrace it more we got to embrace each other more Benita? I uh, is the question about the future like what are we going to do for our future well how do you see the future playing out future so bright i got to wear shades <laughs> um <laughs> I, uh, I guess it depends on how you look at it, you know, um, like like Sister Sin saying, you know, um, Sister Sean saying, if we're doing an optimistic viewpoint, then um, I can see um, us having justice, dismantling white supremacy, and us having a just life, and us getting along, and everybody just, you know, um, sharing and growing and balancing out with the people. And then if not, at the very least, you know, maybe a group of us can get some land and have a, um, you know, live off the grid or something like that, you know, get some, some solar panels and some gardens and some fishing holes and yeah, I guess we can, it depends, you know, it just kind of depends on, on how far we can go with this and whether or not we're going to, um, keep, keep working at it, you know, yeah, we're all Fannie Lou Hamer tired, but, um, are we really, really tired? Like, are we so exhausted that we quit? And that's one thing. I think that if we don't quit and we don't, and we don't, and we don't just assimilate and we don't just accept it, like even, even the, the struggle doesn't have to be a fight. You know, I mean, what I mean by that is there's ways of resisting without doggone drag out killing each other fight right you can and the reason why i know it to be true is because we're here on earth today if the to struggle this the only way for us to work through this the only way to get justice was for us to literally fight we'd be dead like we i mean we we the four of us on this panel we wouldn't be here today our people our ancestors just like this on my shirt you know, all these um, little bodies right here that came across the slave Atlantic, the, 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 the slavery Atlantic trade, right? All of that. They were strategic rebellion. They were strategically rebellious people. They were the kind of people who was like, okay, I see what you're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to work out a plan for that. I'm not going to fight exactly. I'm going to work out a plan because if they fought, then they would have died. They all would have died. Mm-hmm. So we come from a people who have strategic plans and we need to keep doing that. We need to keep having strategic plans. We need to work towards work towards our um, whatever our plan is going to be. Whether we get into small groups and we have a just nation within the small groups or we figure out ways of having just across like the radio waves or however we do it. But like I say, either way, the future is bright. And promote your show. Oh, wait. Well, a, a couple brothers and I, we started this thing called Shy Rise a, a couple years ago before the COVID, and now that has broken off, and the brothers have started this thing called The Collective Perspective, and they've asked me to come on and, and be a part of their collective perspective, and so we're going to have the conversations with Benita, and it's going to be, they're going to stream it on one of their YouTube pages. Um, a brother who's going to stream, his name is Ernest L. Johnson, if anybody's friends with him on YouTube, but... Um, you can also find it if you look up things like the collective perspective or if you look up shy rise shy rise uh, we've done some different shows you can find that or wherever you find podcasts 
or um, I've also done a show called One Drop Elopes. So that's it. All right. So, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you ladies for being on here. Thank you for helping me expand my platform here on Bill for This Network and uh, on Speaker.com and on YouTube. Um, the End of the Bench is my brand, but I am part of a, a, a greater collective, which is me, number one chief rock of Jersey, Brian Bassa, Lisa, uh, Big Illinois, uh, 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 DJ Mad Knox, Cheers Roundtree, and my man Mooka Dean. If I'm, if I'm, uh, oh, James Earl. If I forgot your name, please inbox me and say, hey, dummy, you forgot my name. But I didn't do it on purpose. But with that, oh, yeah, I did forget somebody who just texted me, Joe from Houston, who's on one of my damn shows. So I really feel like a dummy now. But with that being said, man, thank you all for all the support. Thank you, ladies. I want to thank everybody in the chat room. I suck at the chat room, y'all. Y'all know I suck at the chat room. But Big Illinois, uh, uh, Chief Rocker, DJ Mad Knox, Joe from Houston. Uh, first Chicago's first lady, D. Great, my man John, uh, uh, Irene, uh, um, uh, uh, Ben for BS3, uh, 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 Chuck, Kirby, uh, everybody, De Deacon Dale, uh, uh, thank y'all for the support. I suck at the chat room. I told y'all I really suck at it, so please forgive me. It's not that, oh, Black Swan, uh, and everybody in the background who chose not to create a profile or come and talk in the chat room, thank you guys as well. Please continue to support us. I got my man D. I got my man Raider tomorrow. D. Gray tomorrow evening with the Love Jones Raider. Uh, uh, it just gives his perspective on the world. D. Gray tomorrow night. Uh, uh, Love Jones Monday morning. You got the number one chief rock and jersey, Brian. You got my man Ben from BS3. Uh, we we have a collective show. Of some brothers sharing their opinions on the merit of things. Uh, we gonna talk about Valentine's Day Monday and, and, and the significance. So. Tune in to that. I see you. The people who support me, I send you guys the link. Tune in Monday, my, uh, Tuesday morning. My man Michael Wade. Tuesday afternoon, DJ Mad Knox. Me, Joe, Big Illinois. On uh, uh, Tuesday evening, Tuesday night, you got uh, Rare Beauty. Right after Rare Beauty go off, uh, you got New Max Radio with Mandela on the GG. You got my man Deacon Dale, all the way from uh, the Gaza Strip uh, on Wednesday. I mean, uh, uh, D Great Wednesday morning. For the Gaza Strip, my man uh, Deacon Dale, DJ Mad Knox Thursday, Chief Rocker with Sports Therapy in the morning, DJ Mad Knox in the afternoon, my man Matt DeLeon uh, in the evening, DJ Mad Knox, I'm a microwave Friday morning, uh, uh, Knox Friday nights, late nights with uh, Big Illinois, Afternoon, D uh, Deacon Dale and uh, DJ Perkalicious, and 166 hours, so 167 and a half hours from now, I will be back with another panel. We will continue to ce celebrate our history with the, with the continued celebration of our history, because we're going to celebrate our history 365 days a year. And thank you for tuning in. This is your man, H Rap. Two fingers, one word. Y'all know how I end every show. By saying, by paying no homage to Reggie O'Shea and saying, dream those dreams and man up and woman up and live those dreams because life without dreams flows in black and white. Life with dreams flows in technicolors around sound. Again, ladies, gentlemen, haters, and bitter friends, have a good evening. We are built for this network, for the strong, not the weak.